So again, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Dream Series call. This is Len Gardner. I'm facilitating the call with you guys tonight. It's so great to have you with us. It's a, every week this uh, call has grown and grown and grown, <laughs> and it's so great to have people from all over the place on it. This has really been a game changer for me. If you're just now tuning in for the first time, um, you know I personally signed up to take a course by Bruce Wilkinson, and the series is called Dream Again. And for me, it was uh, the perfect timing in my life, actually. And it's been a struggle for me because as a child, I didn't dream. And I've, I've taken very deliberate action in my life, but I've never really looked at the dream that is within me and the purpose behind that dream. And so I've really got a lot of growth going on for myself. So every week I try to condense a five-day course into a mini version for you guys. And it's always my prayer that I'll be able to uh, make, some, make a thread together so it makes sense for you. But, you know, so far we have looked at at um, many things, really, but we've looked at three stages that we go through toward building our dream. You know, the first one, of course, stage one is defining it, you know, figure out what your dream is. And, and we've talked about things like if you struggle with what is that dream, then we've talked about looking at your natural gifts and talents. And you'll pretty much be uh, always kind of be leaning toward those natural gifts and talents because they're God-given. And so that dream is probably going to root from your natural gifts and talents. So the first thing is well, we define the dream and, and we embrace it. We understand we've got to dream and we're embracing it, right? And then stage two is we've got to deal with our comfort zone. You know, we have to understand that the dream is bigger than us, okay? There's no doubt about that. And it's, uh, the dream is a place you've never been before. You know, but it's not bigger than the dream maker. It's not bigger than the one who planted the seed within you. So we need to work with that, you know, with that comfort zone and step outside of it and, and deal with the things that keep us wanting to be inside that zone. You know, it's fear, it's insecurities, it's, it's your self-image, it's a million different things that could keep you from wanting to step outside your comfort zone. But if you continually remind yourself that the dream isn't coming from you and the dream maker has all it takes to fulfill that that dream, it makes it stepping outside the comfort zone a little bit easier. And then number three is um, we talked about stage three is we have to work through the border zones. So what is it, what's the border zones? What are the people whose lives border our lives? You know, we talked about the border bullies. I guarantee you everybody on this call has some border bullies. And border bullies are actually people pretty close to us, and, and they have good intentions, you know. But when you start stepping out and talking about things and taking action toward things that you never have before, the border bullies get really uncomfortable. And they, they don't want you there because they, you know, they're the closest to you, and, and they think you've lost your mind, right? <laughs> they think you're stepping out into something unknown, and, and, and it makes them so so uncomfortable. So they want to whip you back in line and get you back where you're supposed to be inside that comfort zone, right? And they can easily steal your dream and they can they can fill you with negativity. You know, you, how are you going to pull that off? You're going to starve to death. You need to get a job. They'll fill you full of all kinds of things, even though they have good intentions. But you have to work past the border bullies. And then we talked about border buddies. All of us have border buddies, you know, and they're, they're people in our lives. Who, their lives border our lives, but they're just, you know, nice friends. They don't really get too engaged in anything. If you're going forward, they say, oh, that's great. And, you know, they, they, they just don't really, they're not married to it. They're not, you know, engaged in it. So they don't, you know, really encourage you, but they also don't discourage you. And then lastly, we have border champions. And, boy, border champions are few and far between. In our business, that's what we're always looking for. You know, there's leaders. We need a leader. We need somebody to cling to. And, and we know that the people coming in behind us need somebody to cling to. And it's the border champion that – somebody that's been there, done that. You know, whether it's in your personal life or it's in your business life, you know, they, they've already walked that path. They are there to cheer you on. They're there to hold you accountable if you'll let them. They're there to teach you the way, to show you the way. So we long for a border champion. If you don't have that border champion, and you could also label it, I guess, a mentor, if you don't have that, you need to find it. So now we're going into the fourth stage. Um, you know, the fourth stage actually could probably be viewed as the most difficult. You know, it's a stage that follows, obviously, all other three. You've got to find the dream. You've got to get outside your comfort zone. You've got to work your way through the bullies, right? And, and so it comes uh, after all of those, and it's a stage that feels like you're hitting your head against the wall. And probably if I could look at all of you right now when I say that, we've all been there and done that. You know, it's a stage where you actually start questioning your dream in the first place because you feel like, I'm exhausted. I, I've done everything I know how to do. I've worked so hard. You might even be getting a little depressed you know, because things aren't moving as fast as you want them to or you need them to or you thought they would. And that makes you start doubting everything. 
And that stage is called wasteland. You know, you go from identifying your dream to breaking through the zone to battling the bullies to finding a champion, and now you're working through that dream. You're working so hard, but it's not happening. Why isn't it happening? Well, some might say, you know, at that stage when they hit the wasteland, you know, you thought you were going upward and you find yourself in the desert. You know, some might start saying, maybe that's not what God wanted me to do in the first place. And you start questioning all kinds of things. You don't just doubt the dream. You start doubting the dream maker, the one that planted the seed within you. You know, this is a time of tremendous growth in your spirit and in your character if you choose to look at both. You know, it takes humility to do that. But that's exactly what's happening. It's a time to rest. And believe it or not, it's a time to be refreshed and revived for the journey. It's a time that God puts there. It's not a mistake. It's not a failure, right? So, again, you're taking all those positive steps, and it's hard. Nobody said this is going to be easy. And then you're just working yourself into exhaustion, and you're trying to work in your own flesh, right? And you need a time to be refreshed and revived for the journey. You may see some of the biggest changes within yourself of all times if you'll take the time to rest and prepare for the rest of the journey. You know, some of us might get anxious and say, what are you nuts? I've I, I got to make a living, and, and, I'm, and I'm trying so hard, right? But, but it's not going to work to the, you know, to the bigger goal, the bigger purpose, if you will, if all you do is beat your head against the wall and go into a fit of exhaustion. This is, you know, where God will work on you the absolute most. You know, you might be thinking, why would I want to rest? Again, that dream isn't gone yet. I mean, I, I'm not there. And, and you get anxious. But when you're anxious, guys, you know what you're anxious about? You're anxious about what is within your own will. Again, you have to remember, this dream's bigger than you. It's outside of anything you've ever done. It doesn't matter what it is. It's outside of anything you've ever done. And so you really need to rely on the fact that that dream was planted by the dream maker, and he's going to help you get that job done, but not if you work your way into exhaustion. And just before, I'm sure you've heard in our business, you know, people quit just before, you know, it's, they succeed, right? Right on this side of success, we quit. Well, that's that wasteland stage. That's where people get exhausted. It's not working, and they give up, and they doubt that they were ever supposed to be here in the first place. You know, but we've got to keep our eye on the ball and where that dream comes from. So if you look closely at the saints that we read about in the Bible, these people, these aren't stories. These are these were real people. These things, if you're a believer, you know that they are absolutely true. That's what faith is. We don't need to see it to believe it, right? So they were real people, just like you and me. They were in the flesh. Uh, you know, they, they, they were following the dream. They were following what the dream maker told them to do, what he planted within them. And each one of them were taken to a place of great growth, but that place of great growth required a little rest and restoration. And they call that in this, in this series Restoration Mountain. You know, you think about, uh, I'll point one out to you, that sometimes we, don't, we, we, we get in a spiritual zone and we really don't think a lot about the physical zone, you know. But you probably are familiar with the uh, prophet Elijah. I love Elijah. I love every story about Elijah. It was, it was such an amazing man. He, he was an amazing man of God, and, and the miracles that he worked, the hand of God, are mind-boggling, right? God loved Elijah so much that he was one of two men who were taken up. They were swept away. In other words, they were taken to the presence of God without even experiencing death. God just took them because he loved them. Well, Elijah, at one point, had become so discouraged in his journey, even though it's, just, it's crazy when you read it, right, because you see, wow, look at all the things that he witnessed. He was part of so many amazing miracles. He was pushing and pushing and pushing forward, right? He had been eyewitness to some incredible things. But in spite of that, even though all this is going on, you know, he's still under attack. You know, people want his head on a platter. His life is at risk. He's stinking tired. He was done. And, and he found a place to rest, you know, a little bit of shade there. He was done. He couldn't go on. He says, as hard as I try, I'm like the only one standing. He was discouraged in that wasteland until an angel came to him. And you know that angel, what the angel said? The angel brought bread and water and said, Elijah, you need your strength. You need your rest. And, and so God himself brought bread and water to give Elijah the strength to get up and keep going. You know, he was giving provisions and he was giving encouragement so that Elijah could gain his strength for the rest of the journey. And that's exactly what he does for us. But when we find ourselves in the wasteland, that's what we need to do. We need to be quiet, a quiet time with God, 
uh, time of reflection, a time of at that restoration mountain where the dream didn't go away, guys. It just hasn't been fulfilled yet. You know, you're just in the, in, the, in the desert and struggling and wondering and starting to question. But if you take that time, you know, at the restoration mountain, you're going to just be forging ahead and seeing things you never thought were possible. Bulldozing your way forward is not the solution. It never is. Because we know that the dream maker, as long as we're obedient, and we're doing what we need to do to fulfill that dream, he's going to make it happen. It's not in our will, right? But we've got to be ready for that dream. We have to be ready for it. There's Can a lot of struggling that people online? need to do, and, and we've got to be so ready for it. Guys? You guys, whoever's talking, push star six, please. I mean, we'll mute your phone out, please. And so we've got to be ready for it. You know, we've got to be ready for what God brings forth. We've got to get us ready for yeah. it. I have to yeah, tell you that. Yeah, we've got information, and I can... Um, Excuse me, whoever's talking, could you mute your phone out? This is going to be okay. fun on the recorded call, isn't it? Um, so, you know, we've got to be ready for it, and it takes looking within right. ourselves. I can honestly say that, you know, I have over the last several years of my life, a little bit of this, um, you know, time came for me before I came into this industry. But I have learned so much about myself, and I see where so much of my past and things that I dealt with and the roadblocks that I put myself through and my image of myself and all those things had to be reckoned with. I could not stand up. I had to go through a time of rest and restoration and and to be revived and strengthened for my journey. But you know what? I wasn't ready for what he wanted to bring to me. I needed to work on me. And so do you want to stay in the wasteland or, or do you want to move forward? You know, will you choose the restoration mountain or will you spend time in the wasteland because you're too afraid to look inside of yourself to see what God sees you have to change? Look in the mirror, guys. You know, we're all a work in progress, every single one of us. There's not one of us who doesn't have to work on being a better version of ourselves, but only you. It takes a place of humility. It really does. You know, you guys will hear me talk about my past, and you know that, man, I'll tell you what, I came into this industry with an ego the size of the United States, right? And, and I had to be whipped around. I had to humble myself and, and, and realize that I didn't know anything about this business, and I had to listen to people before me who were succeeding. But, you know, through that time of, uh, of, of searching within myself, of having God restore me from things that are, you know, I'll share with you at some point, I'm sure, but things unimaginable, I had to finally deal with things inside of me that were going to thwart everything until I went to Restoration Mountain and I looked inside myself. You got a dream inside of you that was placed by God. Oh, my goodness, guys, please mute your phones. Um, will you live that dream? Will you pursue that dream? Will you chase it and accomplish it? Or are you going to quit? Because, again, you hear over and over, you know, in, a, in, a, in our business world, the success is right around the corner. We quit right before success. In a spiritual world, that's because we're in the wasteland and we give up. This is a huge spiritual lesson as part of the dream series. So naturally, a big part of what applies to you and me is to pursue the dream in the first place, right, and to be able to pour, you know, what we gain into the kingdom. And I, I was sharing right before the call started, it's interesting to me how many people have reached out, and so many people of faith have a big problem talking about money. <laughs> and some people want to spin this message to say it's kind of like some kind of prosperity teaching, you know, where you hear people maybe on television say, write a check for $100 and God will give you 1000 That's not what this is. The word that God does say that your effort will be multiplied. It will be. And, and but most of what we're going to see, we're going to see on the other side of heaven. So everything that we're here for, everything that we're here to accomplish is preparation for where we go when we die. But in the same time, there's a lot of work to be done here it requires money. You know, if, if we didn't deal with money, what would it, if everybody was poor, like some Christians think we should be, who's going to buy Bibles for third world countries? Who's going to feed people and clothe people? Who's going to do any of this stuff? Of course there's a need for money. And, and we talked about in one of the series about God's economy. Listen, God can do anything he wants to do. He rained manna from heaven. He can do anything he wants to do. In fact, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is uh, with uh, G Jesus wanted to abide by the laws of the land, and he was with Peter. They needed to pay their taxes. Taxes on what? 
They needed to pay their taxes. And so what Jesus told Peter, go, go cast your line out there and catch the first fish you catch and get the coin out of its mouth. And there was a, a large silver coin in the mouth of the fish, and Jesus said, now go pay our taxes. He didn't, I mean, that's miraculous, right? But he didn't have to do anything. He could have just rained down coins from heaven. He didn't have to make Peter take action. But it's all about us taking action and what will we do for the kingdom. You know, it's an amazing journey when you look at it that way. We need to fund these things, and we need to have a heart to be used by, by God, right? Do we want to be used by God? Do you, do you even want to do that? You know, our faith is not just about going to church on Sunday and singing some songs and being fed a, a message and going home. Our faith is an everyday, every breath kind of thing. You know, I love the, some of the stories that you guys aren't able to hear from Bruce Wilkinson. He told a story about how, uh, each day, he, he asked God, bring somebody to me today to help. You know, bring somebody my way, Lord. Let me help them. And he shared this story about going into a Starbucks. And when he went in, there was a guy sitting there that just looked, you know, just looked down. And he, and he said to him, you know, how are you doing today? Uh, you, you look a little sad or whatever. I'm not sure I'm paraphrasing here. But he said, you know, what can I do for you? Do you know if you read uh, story after story of Elijah and Elisha in the Bible over and over, they would say, what can I do for you? They didn't wait for you to tell them their life story. They opened it up by saying, what can I do for you? And when Bruce asked this guy sitting there, he said, man, I, I, I'm in trouble. And he said, I'm a welder, and he had driven his truck, and you know, welding equipment is attached to the truck, right? And, and he'd gone in to get a, a Starbucks, I believe, and when he went in, he didn't even take his wallet, locked his truck up, went inside, and the bottom line is somebody stole his truck. So he's, he's in a strange city. He doesn't have his car, he, his truck. He doesn't have a means to make money. He doesn't have his wallet with his ID. He doesn't have a, um, a phone. He has absolutely nothing. He bought Starbucks, and he had coins in his pocket and so he's telling um bruce wilkinson this and bruce says to him well you're an answer to my prayer and the guy was in shock and he said what do, you, what do you mean i'm an answer to your prayer and he said well god god uh, gave me something he wants me to give you something and he keeps a little uh it sounds like it's a little envelope that would fit into his um, shirt pocket and on the outside it says um you asked he delivered and he hands it to the guy, and he says, well, what, what is this? He, you asked, and he delivered. And he said, well, who did you ask for help? Because the guy had told him, I was crying out to Jesus, Jesus, please, help me. I can't get home. I can't, I, he's, been, he's been sleeping on the street for three days. He can't get anywhere, right? So he's crying out to the Lord. And so Bruce said, well, who did you ask for help? And when he opened it up, the envelope up, Bruce keeps $50 in a little envelope for such a time as that. And the guy wept. Well, imagine, you know, he, he wept not just because, you know, he was given the means. He had, when Bruce asked him, what do you need? He said, I need $23.60. Man, I, I'm, I'm reading this, and I'm thinking the guy's going to say, well, I need a new truck, and I need, a, you know, I need to stay in a hotel. He needed $23.60 to make his way by bus back to his home and look at God. So the guy wasn't just moved by the $23.60, the guy was moved because God answered his prayer. But could he answer it if there wasn't a Bruce out there? Could he answer it if nobody was sensitive to the needs of others? If nobody ever said, God, bring somebody to me that I can help, could he answer it if he had no money, if he was broke like some people think we all need to be? So, you know, we need to consider how, we can, how much we can do for the kingdom if we get that mindset of money's a bad thing out of our head and we just follow our dream. You know, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but if you and I, you know, we're, we're here in the flesh and we know we're not going to always be in the flesh, if we could look at each other, we would be blinded by the light of, a, you know, of the very soul that we, that we are. What we're looking at is flesh. We can't, we can't see behind you know, what, uh, the flesh, right? But we know that we're just on temporary assignment here. You know, we have to accomplish a very big purpose. You know, that's why we're here. You're here for a reason. You're not here just by osmosis. <laughs> You're here for a very specific purpose. And that purpose, frankly, is, is kindled within the dream that you may or may not be chasing. But, but our purpose is also everlasting. And what we do here will determine how we live there. You know, our rewards, we'll see a lot of them here, we'll be rewarded for our work here. But our biggest rewards, our eternal rewards, are going to come from heaven. And you know what? We're not all going to be on equal playing ground when we get there. 
I'm going to read a couple of, of, of scripture here to kind of drive that message home, and then we'll open it up. You know, do you realize that when Jesus lived here on earth, again, his glory, we know he's, you know, he, it's the Trinity. We know the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We know that he's the Son of God, right? We know that he died and, and he rose again. But when he was here, he was in human form. His glory was hidden or camouflaged, if you will, by the body, just the way yours and mine is. A glimpse of that glory was seen, though, at the transfiguration, which we read about in Matthew 17. It says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now, why did that happen? Why do we even read about that? Well, it says that Jesus' face shone like the sun. His glory was allowed to be seen, if only for a a moment, and if only by a few people. But it's also a glimpse for all of us concerning the glory we'll have one day that we'll experience in heaven. Remember, he's sitting there with Moses and Elijah. They were already dead and gone, right? And that's what we have to look forward to one day. But do you know that you and I have the opportunity to display our glory in in eternity as well? It's going to be the same for us, guys. This is all a living example. So what we do for God, according to his will and his purposes here on earth, will translate into glory and rewards in heaven. He told us, and that everything that we read is true. So everything that we do here has meaning. It has purpose. It means that you and I will have the opportunity, based on how we've chosen to use our time, our gifts, our talents, and our resources here on earth to shine brightly with our own glory once we enter heaven. And so I want to take it now to um, a passage in Daniel 12, and it says, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. These are people who are dead, okay, and they're transfigured. So multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Listen to this. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That kind of boils it all down for us guys. We need to be wise and we need to shine like the brightness of the heavens and lead as many people to righteousness like, like the stars in heaven. That doesn't mean that you all out there are supposed to be evangelists. I'm not necessarily an evangelist. I've been very blessed to have led some people to the Lord. But that, you know, leading to righteousness could be just be an example for your brothers and sisters. It could be as willing to ask somebody in a Starbucks, you guys go around and you see somebody with a scowl on their face, guys. Usually there's something behind the scowl, guys. Do we ever go up and say, how can I help you? What can I do for you? Do we ever do those things? Well, God has an economy in heaven, and he has an economy on earth. And most of you guys are tuned down here tonight, are part of my journey in this business, okay? And, and I just want to encourage you to dig deep, find your dream, whatever that dream is. And most likely, it's going to be, um, it's going to have a price tag associated. In other words, it's going to be your living, if you will, where your abundance is going to flow, not only to be able to fund things that, yeah, God could fund, but he expects you and I to do it, you know. Not only to do that, but perhaps it's also to give you the freedom. You know, if you have the finances covered and you're able to fund the kingdom, maybe what you need is the freedom of your time to do the work that you were set out to do. So it's always a good thing. Everybody from the beginning of time, you can shake your fists at Adam and Eve, okay? We had to start toiling the earth, and we're all going to have to work all the days of our life, and we work for a purpose. We work for the, for the ability to, Exodus says, uh, God gives us the ability to produce wealth, right? You can frame wealth any way you want to say it. This is not a get-rich thing. But we are in business, and this is a call that's a, a, intended to minister to people in our business. You have a big purpose. And, and, and you know, I can't think of anything worse. If you, if you share my faith and you never do anything, you never go out and, and, and talk to somebody in Starbucks, you never share, you know, share the gospel, you never go on a missions trip, you're still going to go to heaven, okay? <laughs> There's no doubt about that. But, the, but, but don't we want to go with rewards? You know, don't we want to accomplish what we were set out to be here to accomplish in the first place? And that, my friends, always comes down to your dream. Whatever stirs within you. 
you know, I've shared with you guys uh, probably every week, you know, because I'm learning so much about this. And, uh, you know, it's, it, I just always naturally migrate to my gifts of, you know, speaking or writing. That's what I always go there. And, and when I first was, you know, embarking on this journey, first I, I criticized everything, said, y'all aren't doing it right. <laughs> I had to get humble and say, okay, I'll do anything you say. But once I, I started doing what we should do, our duplicatable way of doing business, I still just found myself migrating to those natural gifts. Well, I see why. And it's all coming to play now. Now that I see what's working out for me, I know that's what I'm intended to do. And so I'm following that dream. Where it goes, it goes big places, by the way, for the kingdom, first of all. And I know that there will be an abundance, second of all, because I know what God would have me to do. So I hope that these words have resonated within you guys. It's time for you to unmute yourselves. And, and um, if you want to make any comments and talk about what we've talked about tonight or you know, ask a question, whatever, I'd love to hear from you. I want you to consider your dream very, very carefully because, again, that dream is really why you're here. So unmute your phone, guys. Come on and let's talk. Bill Powers here. I just have a comment. Okay. First of all, powerful call, just absolutely stellar. But Thank you. I remember a quote from Billy Graham, uh, who's big influence in my life, and it said that if a person gets his attitude towards money straight, mm-hmm. it will help straighten out almost every other area in his life. Wow. So getting the right mindset about your money, your finances, will will reckon everything else. Yes, right. All every other area in your life. So I, well, that's I fascinating. Me. So again, fabulous thank, call. Thank you, and thank you for sharing that because you know when we look at um, the Bible, all the lessons that we have. I can't recall now. I know that fear is mentioned 365 times. I think money is mentioned over 700 times. It's it's. I really think that. So many of us have fallen into that lie that comes from you know where, that we're not supposed to have money. It's a bad thing to have money. Well, how in the world? You know, God can rain manna down from heaven, but he doesn't do what he expects us to produce that and to have the heart to pay it forward. That's what we're supposed to be doing, guys. Thank you for that, Bill Powers. Anybody else out there? Just unmute your yeah. phone and come on. This is Sharon. That's so interesting that Bill brought that up about mindset because a little while ago I, I was I had been listening to some Jim Rohn this afternoon, uh, mm-hmm. several derps as a matter of fact, and then all of a sudden it just popped into my head, ready, set, go, and then the word mind wow. right behind it. So wow. Like like Bill, I mean, ready, set, go is a little thing from childhood that we all learned and all the games and stuff that we played, and it kind of set us up for whatever we were going to do next. Mm-hmm. How significant the mind is in that. Oh, my and one of, the things, one of the things that Jim talked about today was who steals those things out of our mind? I mean, who steals that stuff from us? And so, of course, your, my first inclination is, well, no, the enemy does that. No, mm-hmm. we do that. We, we do, do it. that. We absolutely do, Sharon. That's so powerful. And, and that's been such a lesson for me, you know, because I came to my faith in my 30s. And when I came to my faith, I didn't know one church mm-hmm. from another, okay? And I really got wrapped up with legalism. And, and I used to read for my business. Now, I wasn't in this industry until now, but, you know, power positive thinking and things like that. And, man, did I get whipped around. I almost did an exorcism. And you're not so put, you know, after you know Christ, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. And I had so much baggage inside of me. But I was told, no, you don't have to worry about that. You don't think about that. But the things from my past, until I got control of that, you know, and I'm able to fight that and to, uh, override it with positive things, it was absolutely controlling me. You know, as some of the circumstances, you guys will hear at the farm here for the ladies' event, and I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it, I, we just don't have time, but some of my circumstances there, you know, a, a few years back, my biggest storm in my life, actually, but at that, during that storm, I spoke these words I'm going to share with you, and I spoke them often, okay? And I didn't forget that I had spoken them, but I had embedded them within me. And what I said was, my life will never be the same again. I will never have what I have. I was talking about money. I will never have what I had. I will have to work like a dog every day of my life. Now, 
guys, I thought it, I spoke it, I believed it. So even when God brought me past and I was able to get up and start walking again, those words, my mind is still telling me those lies. You're never going to have what you had before. Somebody took it away, you're never going to get it back. I had to get deal with what was in my mind. And, and, and again, that's, it's wrong to say as a person of faith, God tells us to, to, to control our thoughts. He tells us what to think about. He tells us to be renewed you know, um, by the renewing of our mind, be transformed by the renewing of our mind. He tells us the mind, if mind is a powerful tool. And the mind you know, starts with what you think, what you think, you'll speak. What you speak, you'll believe. I mean, it just you, what you believe, you'll put out there to the universe. You know, you just can't be walking around with that garbage. And Sharon, what you said is so powerful because we do have a way of saying, oh, that's the enemy. But the enemy can't get inside our head. It's us. <laughs> so those thoughts of defeat, I can't do it, I won't do it, 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 it's coming from something within you that a lot of times it's going to take going into that wasteland before you ever reckon with it and get rid of it. That's the bottom line. Sometimes it's going to take it there. Thank you, Sharon. That's powerful. I just appreciate your input so much. Anybody else out there? I'm at your phone. I'd love to hear from you. Anybody else before we conclude the call? I feel like I hear somebody out there and you're not speaking up. Um, I'm going to talk for just one more second. I feel like maybe somebody wants to speak up and you just haven't yet, and then we'll conclude the call. But again, you know, um, I want you to think about how short this life is. It doesn't matter how many years you get. You know, my friend, um, Sean, just lost their baby at 70 days long. That's it. Her life was 70 days. So we don't know if we're getting 70 days or 70 years or 170 years. We don't know, but we got one shot at it. This is it. And I don't think anything happens by mistake. So I don't think it's a mistake that I knew of Bruce Wilkinson's work, no doubt about that. I don't think it was a mistake. I just found that this course just rolled out. I don't think it's a mistake that God put it on my heart to try to bring the Reader's Digest version out to you guys. And I don't think it's a mistake that you're on this call. So God has big plans for us, and I can't tell you how excited I am about my life and what he has for me just by getting a firmer grasp on dreams and how I need to work so hard to work on things like, you know, Bill and Sharon were sharing about the mind to just work my way through outside of my comfort zone and know with certainty that that dream was planted by somebody big enough to accomplish it. And as long as we remember that, we don't quit. Anybody else before we conclude the call? Last call. You know, Lynn, I guess I just want to say one more. Go ahead. Uh, never mind if somebody's talking. No, go ahead. Well, I wasn't sure that the name of the book was The Dream Giver or The Dream Maker. Actually, it's the name of a series called Dream Again. Okay. By Bruce Wonderful. Wilkinson. It's an, it's an online uh, course with some video feed and some worksheets and things like that. It's $35. Believe me, it's well worth your time and your money. But um, it's called Dream Again. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're Thank welcome. You so much. Any, you're welcome. Anybody else? Yeah, Lynn and Sharon, again, one last thing I wanted to say, because this was very powerful. It happened about a week ago. I don't remember the exact dream that I had, but that state when you're coming out of a dream just into consciousness just before you open your eyes. And mm-hmm. as clear as a bell, I heard, do something with what you've been given. Wow. Wow. I mean, That's just powerful. like that. It was, it was direct. Uh, I, I didn't necessarily feel like I was being chastised, but it was loud enough that it came with me into my consciousness. And that's that never beautiful. happened. That's well, well, you know, the Bible says he'll counsel you even in your sleep. And I think that's a good example of that, you know. And it's so important. And we're not, it's not always about writing a check. I'm just trying to encourage people to understand that writing a check is a good thing. And, and it's not about just writing a check to be sent off for some foreign mission somewhere. You guys know that, you know, at one point the United States sent out more missionaries to the field than any other country, probably all of them combined. But today the United States is one of the biggest mission fields. Foreign missionaries are coming here because we're so lost, okay? So it, it's not just about writing checks. It's not about going out to some exotic or third world country. It's about the way we live. It's about everything we do, you know. Every, every word we speak, it's just a powerful thing. You know, you reminded me of, um, 
of a, a story, another story that Bruce Wilkinson was talking about, a guy that had gone through this series, and, and uh, the guy's a carpenter, you know, and he was going out to do an estimation on some job, and he prayed that prayer, Lord, who, give me somebody today that I can help. Just give me somebody. And he went in, and when he was dealing with the supervisor there, you know, the supervisor just seemed uh, grumpy or whatever, and he said, you know, you seem, you seem a little troubled. What can I do for you? And the guy just started saying, you know what you could do for me? I mean, I, my marriage is on the rocks, and I love my wife, and I don't want to lose my marriage. So if you've got any way to fix that, then speak up, because it's not good. And he just went ranting and raving, right? And the guy, and the guy says, um, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you go to your office and get a piece of paper and a pen, and, and when you come back, I'll get, I'll, you can write down what you've got to do. And he, he had no idea what to tell this man. But he said, God, okay, you gave me somebody, so give me something to give him. And so when a guy came back, he said, go home and make your bed. And the guy said, excuse me? And he said, go home and make your bed. And he said, how did you know? And he said, how would I know what? And he said, that is one of the biggest things. I don't make the bed, and she sees it that I don't love her. And he said, well, God told me to tell you to go home and make your bed. He didn't write a check. He didn't, do, he didn't write a check. He was willing to speak up. He said, God, give me somebody today you know, that I can help. And so it's, it's a matter of being willing, of being sensitive, you know, looking around and being real sensitive to that, right? It's a, mal- a matter of just going forward and, wa- and being willing to be a vessel. Yep, it's going to involve money sometimes. You know, that example that Bruce gave, it was $23.60. It's going to involve money sometimes. But if we don't have our antenna up and if we're not willing, why would we have an abundance if we're going to squander it away? Why would that ever be? <laughs> you know, uh, one of the most moving moments of my life, Sharon, you, you just inspired me to share this. I talked about it a long time, but I have a really dear friend that walked me through a, a horrible time. And we're, we're just tight. We've known her for 30 years. We're just really, really tight. And she's busy. You know, I was busy. And, and we would just make time for coffee every once in a while. Um, but we usually had to play with schedules a little bit. Very, very busy. And she called me one day, and she said, do you have time for coffee this afternoon? And I knew that was a big deal, okay? And <laughs> she doesn't do that, right? It usually has to be planned. Well, I... I had a lot of stuff on my plate, but you know what? I cleared my plate, and I said, of course. Why? Because I knew there was something on her heart. She would not ever do that. So I had business appointments. I canceled them. I rescheduled them because I knew she needed me. And so when we sat down together, it was, you know, how are the kids, and we did a little bit of that, and this friend, I had never seen her weep, started weeping. And it scared me. I thought, what in the world? So I reached across the table. We were at Panera. And I, was, I reached across the table and I took her hands and I said, what, what is it? What's wrong? Tell me what's wrong. And, and she and her husband were trying to retire. They had been trying to sell their home. They wanted to live in an RV for a while. And then after that, they wanted to build a home in the mountains. And the home wasn't selling. And just, life just was not going the way she wanted it to go. And so she said, I've just been so struggling with the Lord. Like, why are you making us wait? You know, we want to go on missions trips, and and we want to do this, and we want to do that. And she had really a hard time. And she had just come off of a ladies' retreat um, when we met the day before she came off of that retreat. And she was telling me that on the last day they had a powerful prayer session, you know. And she was just crying out to God, God, why won't you do this? Why, Please sell this house, right? She's praying like a maniac. And I get emotional when I tell you what she said. And she said, Lynn, do you know what he said to me when I'm weeping for help? And I said, what? And she said, he said, consider my servant Lynn and all she's endured in my name. And she just wept over that. I wept too, by the way. I was weeping because, you know, she said, I look at your life and all that I've seen, and here I am in my selfishness. I want to retire faster than he is selling the house, and I'm crying out. And he says, concerned of my servant, Len, and all she's endured in my name. That was one of the most precious moments of my life, to know that I had been an example, a a living testimony of my faith, and that our lives were not an accident. It's not an accident that we're friends and, and we've been there for each other. And it always looked like her life so stinking perfect. And she's over here dealing with Job, right? But 
what a precious moment to know that I had impacted to that point where God said, wait a minute, what are you doing? I gave you this friend and you've walked a journey with her. Consider what she's endured in my name. What a beautiful thing. What a reward, right? And so I, I just want to know that when my time comes, I think I've got a few years left in me, but when my time comes, I want to believe that I didn't waste my life, that I did what he sent me here to do. And I don't have unlimited time. And that is one thing that you'll see, you know, the, the, the fight of the enemy. He's a master of confusion and the father of lies. And, and, and you'll tell yourself you don't have time and, and, and you don't have the strength or, you, or you're not bold enough or you're not, uh, you know, whatever. You'll, you'll tell yourself all this nonsense. But remember, the one who planted the seed of that dream, the one who created you, the one who gave you the last breath you just took into your lungs, he's big enough to do it all. So you just have to remember that as you follow that dream. So on that note, any comments, questions, or anything before we close? Very inspiring. Thank you so very much, as always. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for being here. It really is my, my privilege. You know, anytime um, I do something like that, believe me, I get so much more out of it than I could ever give to you guys. So I'm just grateful that I'm able to thread five days of lessons and spit it out in 30 or 40 minutes and <laughs> say, thank you, God. Right? So on that note, I guess that's it, guys. Thank you for being here. We'll be back again next Monday at 7 p.m. If this is, uh, remember, look for the recordings. Um, they will be put up on YouTube. Um, they'll be put up on Facebook. But as usual, guys, if you're getting a nugget out of it, please pay it forward, right? There's somebody out there that probably needs to be hearing the same words here, and they can catch up by um, listening to YouTube and join us next week. You guys go make it a blessed night. I'll see you next Monday. Take care. Bye-bye.